Hello everybody, welcome to episode 49 of This Week in British History with me, Philippa Lacey Brawl. This week, again, we have some fascinating stories. We're going to be taking a look at Nancy Astor, the first female sitting MP at Westminster. Also, St Paul's Cathedral is consecrated, again, let's find out why. And Agatha Christie becomes a character in her own mystery when she goes missing for 11 days. Before we get on to this week's topics, let me please remind you about two other things which I think you'll be interested in. The first one is 2020 is History Project. Now 2020 is History. It, the name is, I've given that, that name because 2020 is going to be one of those years in history which is going to be referred to for a long, long time. Now anyone who has looked into any period of history will know very soon that you get the voices of the important, the influential and the loudest voices coming through. Living in 2020, within a digital age, we may well think that everyone's voices will be captured somehow in some form. I think that might be a trap that we could get ourselves into and actually end up not once again recording the voices of ordinary everyday people. Now, 2020 has been an amazingly tumultuous, <laughs> I don't think I need to put amazingly before the world too much. Anyway, I can't say it again. Uh, year, you know, obviously we've had the pandemic, but we've had a US election. We've had um, beheadings in the streets in France. We've had um, all sorts of human tragedies, political turbulence, societal change, and um, threats to the way that we live our lives. So it's, it's a year that will definitely be referred back to for the rest of time. And I want to make sure that ordinary voices are captured. You can do it in a totally anonymous way. And if you'd like more details on that project, please go to 2020ishistory.com. The next thing, brutal history. So that is going to be my channel along with uh, my dear friend, Catherine Brooks, which will be beginning in 2021. It's going to be brutal in topic, brutal in delivery. It's not gonna be for the faint hearted. It is gonna be for you if you love fun. And as I've said before, the easily offended need not apply. We will be going into some interesting topics. Um, yeah, not for the faint hearted, but it's gonna be a lot of fun, extremely informative and quite unique. So there you go. Let's get on to this week's topics. Nancy Astor became the first female MP to be sworn into the British Parliament on the 1st of December 1919. She wasn't, however, the first female MP to be elected to serve in Westminster. That was Constance Markievicz, but she was an Irish Republican and so would not swear an oath to the British Parliament or take her seat. Nancy Astor is a complex character. She was for women's rights. She was against alcohol because she saw a direct link between alcohol consumption and domestic violence. She was an advocate for the juvenile victims of crime. She was interested in prison reform. However, she was also anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, and held views on slavery, which we would find unsavory today. Telling once an African-American delegation that slaves should be grateful for what had happened because it introduced them to Christianity. Ouch. She was pivotal in getting the legal age required to buy alcohol up from 14 to 18. It was dubbed Lady Astor Bill and it was the first time that a private member's bill put forward by a woman had been passed by Parliament. And her concern about the juvenile victims of crime led to the first departmental committee on sexual offences against young people, which first reported in 1925. Nancy was married to Waldorf Astor. He was second Viscount Astor. His father, Lord Astor, sat in the House of Lords and on his death, Waldorf moved up to take the hereditary peerage in the House of Lords. Nancy then stood and won his seat in Parliament. Nancy may have been the first woman to take her husband's vacated seat in Parliament, but she wasn't the last. Between the World Wars, a third of women who sat in the House of Parliament had taken a seat vacated by their husbands. Nancy held strong views on how society should work and what reforms were required. We know that she did good, but we also know that she was 
sympathetic to the Nazi cause. She had been for the appeasement. And after the World Wars, her views made her more and more marginalised, not just in public life, but in her private life as well. And she became estranged from her husband and her children, although reconciling with her husband just before his death in September 1952. When she died in 1964, she was at the house of her only daughter, another Nancy, Grimsthorpe Castle. She was cremated and her ashes are interred at the Octagon Temple in Clevedon. Now you may have heard some famous altercations between Churchill and a woman MP. That was Nancy Astor and I cannot move away from her story without going through some of these. She had an incredible wit. She wasn't afraid to use it either. But of course, nor was Churchill. And these two clashed on many occasions. I'm going to read you three because they are classically hilarious. Churchill once told Lady Astor that having a woman in Parliament was like being intruded by one in the bathroom, to which she retorted, you're not handsome enough to have such fears. Also on another occasion, she was said to have responded to a question from Churchill about what disguise he should wear to a masquerade ball by saying, why don't you come sober, Prime Minister? And probably the most famous, and there are slightly different wordings um, in different variations of the retelling of this story, but after a particularly heated debate, she said to him, oh, if you were my husband, I'd put poison in your tea. Madam, he responded, if I were your husband, I'd drink it. Brilliant. On the 2nd of December 1697, after taking just over 31 years to construct, the 5th St Paul's Cathedral was consecrated. The St Paul's Cathedral that we know today is a Christopher Wren design. Christopher Wren was tasked with rebuilding the churches and cathedral of the City of London following the Great Fire of 1666. The Great Fire of 1666 is the topic of my walking tour on the Hidden Histories app, which you can download the app for free and then if you want to do the walking tour, you can purchase it within the app and to take you around the streets of London, either if you can get there, get there one day, um, you can follow the story uh, and stand in the spots that I'm talking about, or if you just want to do it from the comfort of your own home, that is perfectly possible to do as well. The St Paul's Cathedral we know today with its domes, which at the time of its design, construction and consecration, some felt were rather a bit too Catholic, a bit too popish, a bit too like St Peter's Basilica in Rome. That St Paul's is the fifth cathedral dedicated to St Paul on that site, the first being in AD 604. But it's very likely that the site's religious roots go back further and that there was a Roman temple to the goddess Diana there. And Romans used to put their temples um, on places that were already known to be spiritual and sacred. And therefore, the history of the site possibly goes back even further as a pagan site of worship. Old St Paul's, the predecessor to Wren's Cathedral, succumbed to the fire on the third day. Flying embers had caught light the scaffolding, which was already erected on the cathedral because there was going to be some sort of renovation work anyway, which Wren was already in charge of. And the scaffolding set light. It melted the lead on the roof, which ran down the pillars, causing them to crack. The roof, the wooden roof fell in and burnt. Now, there was also, there's another parish which you may not know about in St Paul's Cathedral itself. When St Paul's had been extended at a previous time, it had meant the destruction of St Faith's parish church. So the, the congregation of St Faith's had nowhere to go and they began to worship in the crypt under St Paul's. And they're, 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 that's actually known as the parish of St Faith's under St Paul's, as it still is today. And many of the people who went to St Faith's were the booksellers of Paternoster Row. Paternoster Row is very close to St Paul's Cathedral. And the booksellers that worshipped in St Faith's brought their books and pamphlets for safety inside the cathedral, believing, of course, that it being made of uh, stone and the, the churchyard creating a fire break would mean that all of their books and pamphlets were safe. Of course, we know the 
the old St Paul's did burn down and along with it those books and pamphlets. So Christopher Wren oversaw all of the works and was still alive when it was completed. He is buried at St Paul's, he's buried in the crypt and he has a very simple marble tomb. The inscription on the wall above the tomb um, is in Latin, it was put there by his son and it translates to Reader, if you seek his monument, look around you. On the 3rd of December 1926, Agatha Christie calmly kissed her children goodnight, walked downstairs, out the front door, into her car and drove away. Her car was quickly found, but Agatha had gone missing. At the time of Agatha's disappearance, she was already an international sensation. She is, in fact, the best-selling author of all time. Her characters include Poirot, the famous detective, and one of her stories, The Murder on the Orient Express, is one of my absolute favourites, favourite stories of all time and films, in fact, um, by the by. But she was an incredible novelist and storyteller. In fact, it wasn't until the age of eight that Agatha learned to read and write, her mother believing that a formal education was not required for a girl of her middle class standing. And her first novel was written in response to a dare from her sister Madge. That novel was rejected six times over five years, but now her books, uh, there's believed to be over two billion of her books in print at, around the world. And 40 years after her death, she is still one of the biggest selling authors of all time. So back to her disappearance, 11 days passed before she was spotted in a hotel in Harrogate, claiming to have no recollection of what had happened to her in the interim. In fact, if she ever remembered, she never told, going to her deathbed without ever revealing what had happened during her disappearance. So Agatha Christie's greatest mystery was probably where she was during those 11 days of December 1926. Thank you so much everybody for joining me this week. Before I go, please let me remind you once again, 2020ishistory.com, please go and check it out if you want to make sure that your voice is captured in this amazing year so that historians of the future will be able to know what was going on in ordinary people's thoughts. And also look out for notifications for the new Brutal History channel. Until next week, take care. I'll see you again soon. In fact, it wasn't until the age of eight. Let's just check I'm still on. She was pivotal in getting the legal age to buy alcohol down from 18. What am I on about? Nancy Babe. Mm, Nancy Babe. <laughs> Gumption. Old St. Paul's, the predecessor. Old St. Paul's, the predecessor. Hmm.